It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woohoo! Yeah, baby. And today, starring Mr. Ed Hartman, who's going to talk to us about film scoring for indies and shorts. Yeah. Thank you, fake audience. Thank you, fake band. And let's see who's in that chat room. Hello, everybody. How are you guys? Good to see you all. Hello, Dan Weber, Ken Mesford, Bob Gunnerfell, Gabby Moore, Ewart Williams, Ulysses Carter, Alex Dillon, Alec, Alan Gilbert, Pete Mason, Andre Stepani, and Carl Wurzbach. Chapters Publishing, uh, Khalid Hamad, uh, Aaron Northern, El Rosso uh, Emil, Martin Gravel, Reine Bear, Dean Turner, Carl Wurzbach, if I didn't say that already, Floyd Armlin, Edmund Red, Carrie, Carrie Harchin. Um, yeah, let's smash those like buttons. Why not? Darren Moss, Chuck Sadowski, Patrick Adams, Pierre Venio, Dan Weber, Satat 11, Glenn Letts, Paul Ricker, wow, big turnout today. Jim Stamper, Kristen Knight, Chris Anderson, John DuPont, hello all. So I'm excited. Um, for many years now, I've had a friend named uh, Ed Hartman. Well, actually, he was a, a taxi member first, and I met him through taxi. Um, and uh, I've wanted to have him on the show, uh, and he's asked several times, and every time he asks, um, I'm booked up weeks in advance, and I had something that postponed for today, and Ed was gracious and said, I can do it. So we are going to talk about film scoring today. Um, okay. I'm all situated here. I feel a little discombobulated after having a few days off. Um, so, uh, let's see, Peter Rahill, we got him in there, Dave Merkel, DW Music and Songs, Bunny Adventures, <laughs> that sounds like my backyard, uh, uh, Wendelin Landers, all right. So, yeah, it should be a good one. You know, frankly, it's something that I've long wanted to do on the show and have just never gotten around to it, so I'm really glad that we're doing it today, and Ed's a very smart guy, and we'll be able to explain it all to us. So let me read you um, some of his bio here. He specializes in making, uh, he's a, a drummer, a percussionist, I guess is the broad general term. Um, he plays drums, he teaches lessons, he plays all kinds of percussion, but he specializes in making music with mallets, which obviously not everything he does is done with a mallet. I said in the bio, so maybe he's not as cool as a guitar slinging rock star. But when rock stars look at his credits, they're probably a little bit jealous, and I can't blame them. Um, his music has been in feature films like The Blind Side, Scooby Doo, The Mystery, Be Scooby Doo, The Mystery Begins, The Cold Light of Day, Surviving Christmas, Into the Fire, Spirit of the Game, A Different Sun, Cool It, Minnie's First Time in the Turkey Bowl. Um, He's also scored music for the feature films as The Earth Turns, which uh, got 34 Best Score Awards and nominations. Fitz, uh, uh, who made, from Who Made Who Productions, the 28, uh, 2008 sorry, Alberta Film and Television Awards nominee for Best Feature Film in the documentary Project Columbia. Um, He's also scored a bunch of short films, including Sham Therapy, The Son, The Father. Uh, oh, it's one title. The Son, The Father, Pause, Little Peter Needs to Fly, End Zone, The Three Stars, Trauma, Winston, Those in Need, and A Rich Man. Some of his TV placements, and he gets a lot of those, uh, include The Twilight Zone, Revenge, Motive, Twas the Night, um, Katie Morgan, for those of you who know who she is, she's a handful, Big Love, Lucifer, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Passions, Let's Make a Deal, Doc Block, Greek, Emerald Green, Nature, Gourmet Adventures with Ruth, um, Channel 5 takes Latin, Relic Hunter, Extreme Towers, America Now, Shalom in the Home, Toddlers and Tierras, and many, many more that, frankly, I just didn't have room to put in there. 
But it, it is the, the short films and uh, the indie film scoring that I mainly want to talk about today. So let's get Ed on the phone. Hopefully my little rig will be working here correctly. I hear sound. Hello. And there he is. Hello, Ed. How hey, are you? Hey, how are you? Good. good. Well, oh, well I'm, 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 there's weird. It's still ringing. It's still ringing? Oh, no, go ahead. I think I have the monitor on. Okay. All right. There you go. So, right. uh, and yeah, just to let you know, Ed, the rig that I've got hooked up for the audio has some sort of little weird delay that causes a little comb filtering. So, um, if you hear anything that sounds weird, that's what it is. But anyway, how yeah. are you? I'm very good, in good shape. Uh, very busy these days, uh, teaching and writing and scoring and everything. Man, oh man, I just read your bio to everybody, and uh, impressive bio. Um, you know, for as long as I've known you, and I know you pretty well, I mean, you know, we've talked on the phone a couple times a year. We went out to dinner. I don't know. How many months ago were you out here? Like, I don't know, nine or ten months ago? Was, we, yeah, I was in the summer. I was down for a film uh, festival or something like that for the film that I produced and scored. Yeah, so uh, tell us about that film that you produced because, yeah, not only is Ed Mr. Music, but he actually ended up producing a film. Tell us all about it. Right. Well, I, I think what's so remarkable about it is that it started off out of licensing. And, uh, you know, I, I thank Taxi for getting me involved in licensing to, to a great extent. I had a little bit of success early on. I mean, if I take it back a little farther to 2001 or so, I had a, I had a Christmas CD of Mallet stuff in a PBS show or HBO thing, and then I got some music on... Uh, Oh, other other pro surviving Christmas, blah blah blah. Anyway, and then when I when I had a little extra money and I'd been following Taxi for I don't know ten years before I decided to join, um, I, uh, I I I uh, you know got involved in Taxi and that trained me how to write music for film and television to a great extent. And I again I thank you and Taxi, especially for the rally for all of that help. Um, and then I've been involved in teaching at the rally occasionally and where I can uh, to help out as well. Anyway, flash forward to, this is a wild story, flash forward to about 2013, and there was a article, there's a thing, there's a thing called the Horror Classic Film Board that found some footage from a film, and they couldn't identify it. They spent years looking for it. They eventually got a hold of the great niece of the filmmaker. Okay, <laughs> following. Yeah. So I've been teaching a, a, a student for years, and uh, he graduated, and then his mom started taking drum lessons. This is getting weird, right? This is serendipity <laughs> gone amiss. Anyway, so years later, a couple of years ago, about 2018, I'm teaching his mother. She sees a track of mine on a YouTube channel uh, of mine. Uh, I put a... a I think it was a pitch, probably the taxi, for a Danny Elfman-style track, and I put it against uh, a Buster Keaton scene that worked really well for promo. Yeah. Anyway, she saw that, and she said, hey, I got this silent film. Do you want to score it? Okay, sure, why not? Anyway, so she put me to work. I spent about a month scoring it. It came out pretty damn well. We had money behind it. We mixed it at Clatter and Din in in. Seattle, which is an excellent post studio, probably the only one left at this point, really well mixed, uh, and and then we decided to throw it in some festivals, starting with the Seattle Film Festival, which it eventually did get in, and then eventually, 122 festivals later, wow. a seven-day screening in L.A. for Oscar qualification, I am not kidding. Unbelievable. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so what I know about, and, and the great thing about that is the film was online to the Oscar audience, plus we sent out about a thousand DVDs to very specific people, producers, directors, including Mr. Scorsese and Spielberg. I know they have a copy of this <laughs> yeah. film. Anyway, and, and now the film is on Amazon right now. My website has links, uh, and it's going to Turner Classic Movies in the next month or two. 
Unbelievable. I'm hoping to do a live interview when I'm there. This all came from licensing. So that the line between licensing and scoring is a very thin line. So I, I, I tell people, if they want to get involved in scoring, licensing is their best way to understand it. It's ironic because film scoring of, it used to be by film composers, that was their thing, and then in between scores they would make tracks for libraries for needle drop that could be used for licensing. <laughs> but anyway, now that we have all of this equipment and everybody can do it, it's not that hard to do it. What got me started, though, was through making tracks enough that I got very comfortable with logic for me and then learned how to sync music to film, and that's how it worked. So in general, I, again, licensing has been a very smooth line for me uh, into, into film scoring. So the, the film is very exciting, and, and the other thing it taught me that I think is exceptional, if there's one thing somebody learns from this discussion today, is that I do believe that any time you can flip the model and you can become the client, then you have a very good chance of understanding your, your business and your field. In this case, I became producer. A secret that nobody really knows is that film composers never get invited to festivals. That's a fact. Even Bear McCreary will tell you that. <laughs> and he's one of the great composers in Hollywood. Musicians, so, always at the end of the line, you know, the, la the last... Um uh, last line light them on, on you know any budget and, and and apparently last as far as social hey Ed can you switch back to the regular phone rather than the headset we're getting a lot of uh, people oh, okay. talking sure alright how's that is that better um, are you close to the phone it sounds like you're I three am. feet of I, oh, hang on. I did have the speaker on I'd try that how's that that's Any good. Better? Yeah, it sounds less grady, that's for sure. Um, okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm and, comfortable with this. This is fine. And I, I'm getting a little bit of slap. You know what? I'm going to call you back. I'm going to hang up and call back. I don't know why this happens, but sometimes the this uh, echoey thing just starts happening even worse. So I'm going to hang up and call you back in about all 10 right, seconds, all right? Sorry about that, you guys. All right, let's try this one more time. How's that? Is any better? Uh, yeah, still getting that weird echo. That is so weird. I have no idea why this happens. Oh, well, tomorrow um, I've got one of the techie guys that uh, should be working on the road rally coming over to the house, so maybe he can figure it out, because I okay. sure haven't been able to. Um, so the big question is when somebody says, would you like to produce a film? Um, you know, what does a producer do? And when you said yes, did you have any idea what a producer does and how did you, you know, learn how to do it? I had no clue how to be a producer. Absolutely none. I had never done it before in my life. Uh, well, I don't know about that. As a kid, I was making Super 8 films, so I'm back to where I started. <laughs> uh, now, this particular project, I did not make the movie. Let me back up and, and give some background to this. This is a 1938 unreleased silent science fiction film. It's 45 minutes. It's an easy watch. I recommend people to watch it and let me know what they think. Give them the name um, again and, and tell them where they can find it. Oh, As the Earth Turns. And if you go to AsTheEarthTurns.com, which I'm going to type into the comments. There it is. Um, you should be able to find it. Uh Anyway, so this film was done by a, a Seattle filmmaker when he was 20 years old. It was his ninth film that he had already done. This was he was he was Orson Welles in Seattle outside of Hollywood. Okay, and he wound up going to work for Disney, and then he, he directed an Academy Award-winning documentary in 1950. He did stuff in the mid east, crazy. I'm working on a documentary about him right now, and I'm writing a screenplay of a biopic for him. That's how crazy this has become. Now, uh, my involvement started off simply as being a composer, and uh, that was my original goal on this. And I remember my my co-producer, uh, executive producer, 
she said, well, do you want to do more? And that, my original thought was, no way. <laughs> I just want to compose. <laughs> but as I realized that the more I learned about this process, the better. So for me, producing became editing the film, finding more footage, uh, which I did and edited in. We were working with a couple of different companies in town to do digitize and all the rest of it. And then uh, understanding the backstory and then as and then got involved in submitting films to festivals, primarily through a portal called Film Freeway, uh, which is a huge deal. And if you learn how to do that, it can be a big deal. And I've actually submitted my own little videos through that to festivals successfully as well. So again, these are things you can do. You don't have to wait for a filmmaker to make a movie. Uh, during the pandemic, um, oh my, I can't remember, his great B movie composer, movie director, uh, Roger Corman, had the oh, yeah. Roger Corman Pandemic One Time Film Festival on Facebook, and I made a short film and entered it in that myself. With the, and you had to use a cell phone. So I'm just saying there's crazy stuff going on out there that you can do it. Just as we all have access now to make music, you all have a phone, you can pick up a, a cheap camera, whatever, so you can do this sort of thing as well. But as far as this film came, I, I started increasingly getting involved, and at this point I have done everything there is in producing except for actually direct and make the film itself. I'm, I'm a classic producer uh, of, of what it is to find. The producer usually finds a director, finds the, you know, the, it puts the right. whole project together. In this case, I've taken the film from a lost state completely and, and brought it into the present uh, and put it in festivals and distribution. I've set up all this stuff myself, which is crazy. Uh, but now I feel like I really understand the industry much better, and that's what's cool about that as well. So again, I, I would recommend it, as much of this as you can do, uh, learn learn about it. And then you'll have a lot more sympathy for filmmakers, whether they're uh, licensing your tracks in the film or hiring you to score. And I've learned a lot about budgets of films and how they how much they cost and all the rest of that. And there's a, I put a bunch of links in the uh, chat when I, before I, we got on, and one of them is a interesting article about film scoring versus um, licensing on how filmmakers can save money by licensing the score versus work for hire. So, so I have just a like question. Have in, yeah, I have a question ahead. on the subject of licensing. Um, as you and I discussed at dinner, I'm really, really on a tear to get uh, more indie filmmakers running listings for their projects with Taxi because every time we do that we you know I, literally every single time we've run listings for indie filmmakers working on films the majority of the music in the film ends up coming from taxi members and while it doesn't yeah. pay a fortune people love getting that credit and uh you know i mean usually they pay somewhere between 100 and 500 dollars a track or a song to license this stuff but it's a nice credit to have and Absolutely. Uh, and the filmmakers yeah. love it because they're normally going to uh, royalty-free music sites that frankly oftentimes don't have great music. And when I've asked indie filmmakers, why do you go to royalty-free libraries? It's because they are under the misguided impression that if it's not royalty-free, that they're the ones that are gonna have to write the quarterly check for the performance royalties. They don't understand how performing rights organizations like ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC in the, in the US yeah. pay that money, you know, and, and that's why they go to royalty-free sites. So uh, I think that there's a lot of educating, <laughs> there's a lot of educating that could be done with indie filmmakers to help them understand how they can get better music for the same amount of money. It's crazy. That's right. That, that's very correct on all, all levels there. And I deal with filmmakers all the time. I did a web series and, uh, and, a, and a film in the last couple of years that had the same royalty. Well, it was like one of these guys that does free music for films. They just want the credit, whatever. They had the same track in two different things. It, was a, it wasn't that great of a track, uh, but, but, you know, that's how ridiculous it gets. And one of them was like a main theme for the series. I think, man, what a waste. You could have had somebody write something original for that. I love that idea of Taxi got more involved, and I'd be happy to help with, with resources I have on that, too. Because I think there, there are a lot of people out there 
I think we're very we're very tribal. I've realized uh, as filmmakers and musicians. And one thing by learning how to be a filmmaker, I'm breaking out into another tribe. There, there was a friend of mine, a great composer uh, in the Seattle area, Eric Getz, who I ran into at a happy hour of filmmakers and musicians that were happening before we all had to separate. Uh, and and what was intriguing about it is I had actually recommended to, to the Office of Film and Music of Seattle that we should have name badges and we might want to have filmmaker ones and composer ones. And that great way idea. we could know our tribes. We could go to the happy hour and say, well, I want to meet the filmmaker. Well, the irony is Eric made this, he, I, I saw him and he was wearing a filmmaker one versus a musician one. And, and I thought, nice. Eric, why are you wearing a filmmaker when you're a composer? He goes, well, I'm, I'm actually on the film side. Uh, that's the way I treat myself. And it was brilliant because I realized the filmmakers tend to talk to filmmakers and the musicians tend to talk to musicians when, you, when you're at an event like that. Right. And so, you know, my recommendation is uh, learn how to be a filmmaker, understand that group and break into those those things and find filmmaker groups uh, rather than uh, musicians groups. If you want to talk about something more than music, you want to talk about film, man. And if, if you want to meet with music supervisors, find music supervisor groups, <laughs> you know, right. stuff like that. So it's it's all about kind of seeking out other tribes and, and making peace arrangements with them. Uh, but, you know, you know, as far as, as licensing goes, uh, yeah, you can license uh, one song. You can license the entire score. And and one of the great, you know, problems is ignorance that uh, it, it, this can work in a lot yeah. of ways. A filmmaker may approach me and say, well, uh, can you write this score? And then they're going to assume that they're going to own the music forever. Well, that right. would be great if my name was John Williams at a million-dollar budget for music. Uh, sure, you can own my music for that amount of money, but if you're going to pay me a couple hundred bucks or five hundred or thousand dollars for a score or something like that for a short, I'm sorry, I'm not necessarily going to give you rights to that score. But the the reality is, if I license it non exclusively with with a filmmaker, just like a, a piece, and I, I use I basically you know one trick about contracts is they're not copyrightable, so you can raid every contract on the planet. And simply change the uh, the wordage on it and, and fit it to yourself. So over the years, I've I've picked up many contracts and, and created my own custom contracts for non-exclusive license of of score, and that allows the filmmaker to use the score perpetually. It's going to be part of the project. You're not going to have to pull it out later, mm -hmm. uh, and yet I can still possibly use my music in other things as well. Now the do reality they, do, of that. Do... Do they give you any sort of like, you know, you can't license this for another indie film for two years or any restrictions like that? Well, that, that's something you can negotiate if you really feel that's an issue. Most of the time they don't because they're delighted to get a, an original score at a reasonable price. Uh, the reality is this. Most music that you write for a film is probably not that good for licensing elsewhere because right. it's synced to picture. It tends to be... Uh, you know, I, it's not when, when I, I, I notice differences between my score music and when I write a track. A track tends to have a beginning, middle, and an end. Cues for when when you write a cue for a scene, it's got to just fit the scene, and it doesn't necessarily end. It could just fade out or something like that. Right. So let, realistically, let, let's clarify parts. that because you use the word cue. Um, which yeah. you used it in the right way, but because our, our members are so trained to think right. of all, everything with the word Q in it is an instrumental cue. So yeah. it, it's something that I talk about pretty frequently, but when you're scoring to picture, you are scoring to things that happen in the scene. Changes, right. maybe a, a camera angle, an edit, a, a venue change where you know they go from one room to another or daytime to nighttime. Uh, where an instrumental cue is one thing. It, it, it's musically, thematically, one thing from top to bottom, and the editor, the music editor, or the video editor is going to cut it up to fit the scene, whereas when you're scoring the picture, you are actually making those changes by writing them in, correct? That's absolutely right. And, and in fact, you know, most licensed music tends to be source music that's used coming out of a radio or something like that, for me anyway. Uh, right. So, no, that that's true, and that's a reverse process. And, and you can train yourself by scoring, by practice scoring, and I recommend a couple of websites. Pixabay is a great place to get images and video for free, 
and you don't even have to attribute. Uh, yeah, I usually say from Pixabay. Anyway, if you look at my videos, you'll see lots of stuff. Also, Internet Archive, you can find public domain footage, which is how I found the Buster Keaton film that got me this gig. Okay, so anyway, getting back to the license option is it can be non-exclusive, and uh, and the only reason it's non-exclusive is that if it were to get on television or a broadcast or something like that, then I can take the publishing and the writers. The reality is most filmmakers, indie filmmakers, they don't have a publishing entity anyway. They're not members of BMI or ASCAP. They have no idea what any of that is. So if, if nobody takes that, whatever royalties are there are totally lost to begin with. Frankly, most shorts are not going to make it on television, although with all of the crazy streaming stations going on right now, right. it's very possible that there will be building amounts of oddball stations with short films that could yield royalties in the future. The and, and, chan issue, and chances yeah. are it's not going to make it to a theatrical release other than film festivals. Uh, am I right That's about right. that? Yeah. yeah. And, of course, the theatricals we only get out over overseas even to begin with. Right, film. performance royalties and, for theatrical showings um, only pays overseas, not in the U.S. That's right. And, and you know, on that level, my, my music of the blind side was from musicsupervisor.com, which gave me publishing. They don't take it because they believe it's not their right to take. God bless them. <laughs> and uh, I'm still making money from the blind side, a 15-second marching band cue called Football Funk, that I don't know what I originally wrote it for, probably a taxi listing, and then it they wound up using it in the blind side. And and for those that are interested, it paid up front about 1500 bucks to me for this movie that nobody knew about when it first came out with Sandra Bullock and people like that. And, and I was at a taxi rally when I got the email from Music Supervisor telling me it was in the film. <laughs> Sweet. So, let, so let's go. It comes in circles. <laughs> let, let's go to like the very beginning of all this and, and explain the difference and, and give me the short version of what the difference is between a short film and an indie film, although I'm guessing they're both indie, but what's, you know, how long is a short? <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, an indie film is simply anything that's not made by the majors, just like an indie record company is anything that's not the, by the big three in the end, I would guess. So, uh, you know, I, I would say you have shorts, features, and docs or documentaries. Those are the three types of films. Around. So how? what's the time range? What determines if something is a short? Less than, you know, 90 minutes, right. less than two hours? Well, is it? I, I have good information about this, and, and because of my Oscar qualification film, I learned that as of at least 2019, a short was anything less than 20 minutes, but a feature was anything over 45 minutes. Our film was 45 and change, so luckily it got in as a feature. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That was, in fact, what was interesting about that timing of 45.36 or whatever it was, was that it was able to be a feature and a short depending on the festival it was in. It was crazy because the, the break was right there. Most shorts tend to be anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes, I'd say. But they could be anything up to 30 or 40 as well. You start so, getting over 45, 60, 80, those are features for sure. So Documentaries let's... are rarely have kind of timings on them. I'm working on a mini doc that's 15 minutes. I would say most documentaries probably are an hour. So typically. you've already told us about how you meet people and network with, with your tribe and with their tribe. Um, so that's your, your marketing, let's say. So let's say the marketing works and somebody approaches you and says, I would like you to score this film. And let's say that they are somewhat ignorant because maybe they just don't know. Um, they say, okay, I'd like you to score the film. What's the, how does the conversation go? Do they say, I, you know, there's a composer I really like that did another film. Um, can you watch that and tell me, can you do something in that style? Or do they explain musically? what they're looking for. I mean, how do they know um, and how do you find out if they want like a classical orchestral score or if they want kind of an edgy well, hip hop hybrid score? Right. You know, where, where does it all begin? Well, you know, they find you, they have to understand what you are good at as well. So hopefully they're gonna come to you and say, 
I like what you did with these films. I'm looking for something in this vein. Yeah. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that always happens. Sometimes they, they appreciate your credits and they go, hey, I think this person can score my films. They don't know what I can do. Uh, and I will try and be honest with them and say what my strengths are because generally the best collaboration, and score is a collaboration. It is not just, I'm, I'm not just doing uh, food at the, you know, the food cart <laughs> during the, the production here. This is, music is half of the experience of a film. And I, I try to encourage filmmakers to understand the importance of music as they put it in. There are films that are mostly uh, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, people just talking in there and music is very light underscore that's just to kind of set up an atmosphere or something like that. But when we think of great scoring, we tend to think of thematic music, uh, especially the opening of a film, uh, and then that sets up the themes throughout it. So it really depends on the film. Shorts rarely have much theme because you don't have a whole lot of time to develop it. Uh, really, you uh, in, in fact, a lot of shorts, they'll use licensed music uh, from rock bands or things like that in the beginning and end, and then they really just want some underscore, some light piano and strings or something to bring out things. So the process is what I'm doing right now with you. I'm going to do my best to educate them to understand all the variations and the possibilities of what score is. I've created articles about them, a recent one through Stage 32, as well as other other kinds of uh, articles as well that I've done myself, and I try and refer people to that to, to help grease the wheels for that. Um, so, you know, the, the other thing about it is that film scoring is very similar to licensing in that there are references. Usually a filmmaker will come to me with a film, and they may have temps in there already, or, or will, will suggest, hey, I'm looking for this type of uh, – a score in there as well. How so, often you know, does that, how often set up ahead? To how do often it, uh, how often does that happen where they have some refs already in there? Well, if they don't, I'm going to probably ask for some, which is always dangerous because you know once you open up that door, uh, temp files and references can can really kind of uh, you know surround you with limitation. Uh, now. The, the interesting thing about scoring is you may wind up uh, doing a, a scene seven to twenty times until you get it right. And that uh, was my that was my next question. Is okay. Yeah. So so you take the lead and you say, well, are you looking for something like this? Uh, assuming that they don't have a temp, and maybe you suggest some temps. Uh, I mean, how is it? economically feasible on the end of, of the composer's end. I mean, you could think that, you know, you're, let's say you're doing a 15 minute short and maybe you think that you can bang that out over a period of a couple of weeks and maybe you're going to do 40, 50, 60 hours on it. And all of a sudden now you're doing everything multiple times. You could end up spending yeah. a half, half a year before you've made this filmmaker happy. Um, do you just have to say, well, you know what, it, it's not about the money, it's about the experience and the credit? It, you know, it's a little bit of both. Uh, there is a, and and, and what will happen is just like with licensing, you'll have temp love occur, and, and right. people can fall in love with stuff. And then they'll change. Sometimes they'll they'll go, hey, we really like this, but you know what, you did this and we like that better. So it's a, it's a, it has to be a collaboration where you're going back and forth. Now, there is one step that I generally do, and, and this can be done online now as well. It used to be done more in person, and that's what we call a spotting session. Right. So usually what happens is when you first meet with a filmmaker, you go through the film scene by scene, and this can take time on a feature. It can space, you can spend many hours doing this, and, and they're going to say, hey, I want music here, 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 and you got to take really, really good notes, and, and there's ways to do that in you know, in logic and all the rest of that and mark things. Uh, but it is, it is tricky and, and you really don't know what people are going to like until you try a few things. You can, there are composers that will set limits on rewrites. Um, they'll say, I, I'm going to give you five rewrites. And then beyond that, you have to pay them, you know, per, per hour or something else like that, which is not a bad idea. It puts a limitation on there. Do you There's charge... no guarantees of success in this business any more than there is in licensing. I can tell you this horror story, though. I was hired by a, a, a filmmaker uh, and uh, to do a, a feature, 
uh, about 80 minutes, and it was a student filmmaker that was uh, just finished up film school. This was kind of his thesis project, and I got involved in it, and I I got it done. I was doing it, and I was getting these great comments from this person, and they said, this is great, this is wonderful, everybody loves it. And then uh, about two weeks before it was due, this was maybe a six-week long project, I started getting these more negative comments saying, well, I don't know if I like this. I don't, you know, things are changing. And I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. And I was getting rewrites and all the rest of that. And I finally, I finally just decided I'm going to finish this thing. And I sent it to him. I said, here's the best I can do. And, uh, and made sure he got the complete thing. In the end, he rejected the score. Uh, he didn't like it. And he didn't want to pay me, which was a double whammy. Yeah. I convinced him that was a bad idea. And that um, <laughs> in the end, he needed to pay me for the project, whether he uses the score or not, which is in the contract. One of the great things that you have to do in your contracts, you always have to make sure you get paid, man. Maybe a little up front, maybe a little later. Well, how, you how do you... Do. How do you know how much to charge? Do you charge by the run, you know, running minutes of the film? If if the film is fifteen minutes long and it's score heavy, do you have a set rate that you charge? That's a, a multiple. I of... No, I don't, because there's a very big difference for me writing light piano music and full orchestral, you know, full blown stuff. Now, there's also many other levels of this, and there's plenty of rate sheets out there that you can look from. There's there's all sorts of wonderful people on Facebook, different groups of film scoring composers that have talked about this and anyway. And and you gotta understand that there's a what's happened as we've moved to electronic scoring in the old days, you had somebody play the piano and work right. out a score and then have an orchestrator score uh, orchestrated, hire an orchestra to do that. I mean there, you got a hundred people involved in the music session on that. That's very different then nowadays, where not only I have to be a composer, I have to be an orchestrator, a performer of all the instruments, and maybe I bring in a couple of live players that maybe makes it better. And, and as with licensing, adding one live musician, if it's yourself, I don't care if it's triangle, that will sell the score to anybody. Because for whatever weird reason, the ears always go to the live instrument. And once they enter, they right. go, oh, that's okay, then the rest of the score is all right. Sounds good to me. So those are tricks that I, I learned that can bring keep the score price down. What I can say is you might get paid anywhere from a dollar to a thousand dollars a minute. It, it is that wide of a range on there, and you have well, to decide if you know as you learn how to do this how long you think something's going to take, and then divide that by the hours you're putting in, and just come up with, you know, okay. I need $75 an hour to, to feel like I'm making money. Also, if, it, if there's going to be a back end, which again, in most indie films, there's probably not, but let's say there is, then you want to hopefully have, you know, the, the, the publishing and the writer's side of that, if you can have it as well. So there, there's no one way or the other. There's a wonderful chart. Somebody on Facebook uh, who I'm in a group on who, who does managing from film composers put together, and it had a sliding scale. Here's one thing to understand. Traditionally, film budgets have been anywhere from 1% to 10% of the film budget. You mean the, the music, the, the music the, budget? The music budget. No, right. no, the film budget uh, itself. So in right, other words, but, but the music, a, but the music budget will be ten percent of the entire 10 film budget. Ten percent of the film budget. Got yes. It. Okay. So, so if you have a film that's ten million dollars, then you take one percent or ten percent of that. I, I'm not going to try to do the numbers on there. And the the larger the budget, the smaller the what is it? The, the large. Well, I can't remember. How's it go? Uh, <laughs> confused. Anyway, the point is for the the. The more ownership you get, you it would be a higher, higher. You would do it for cheaper. It's convoluted, it. but but if you if you kind of think about where the ownerships are, how much effort's involved, whether there there are all in cases where as a composer you have to you're in charge of the entire production of music, where you're not you're you're going to be hiring orchestras and musicians and then giving them a budget. Now that's taking quite a risk. Because yeah. that means if you miss, you know, miss figure on this, you could lose money on this. If you wind up uh, paying for sessions that don't go anywhere, that the that the director rejects, 
uh, you know, you're on the hook for that. So I would say that's always a dangerous thing to do. My fan, and, 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 you know, if you're on a movie that has enough of a budget for a, a full orchestra, there's probably plenty of other people that can handle that production. You don't need to do it. So I would advocate do what you're good at, do what you're comfortable doing. Be prepared, though, at this point, that your job will be probably to deliver a score that is at a acceptable uh, quality of production level, just like we well, are with licensing. And, and it that can't big, be just that you know, a MIDI a, file. It has that to big, be a, a produced track. That begs an important question. Are these people ever delusional? Are the film producers ever delusional thinking that they're going to hire somebody for not very much money to work on their indie film or their short film and get a John Williams quality uh, score out of that composer? Or do they understand that, you know, they're not working with John Williams? Right. Um, well, I'd say, sure, they want that. <laughs> right, <laughs> of course not? they do. And, but, and there are people that can actually deliver stuff like that, amazingly, I've heard. So, you know, I actually had to create a, a John Williams track for something once, and, you know, it came out pretty good. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I, and John Williams writes pen and paper, and then, right. then works with orchestrators and puts that out. So, you know, there, there's a whole other way of looking at all this stuff. Uh, but, but, you know, there, and there, there's a couple other details here is that when you create the score, you may have to deliver stems. And stems can be defined as every possible instrument on the, on the uh, project, on your session, or it could be groups of things like the brass, the strings, the percussion, whatever. A right. secret when you're, when you're scoring a Hollywood orchestral is add an electric bass. Don't rely on the upright bass. It adds a punch to it. Those are, there's little tricks that I've learned through this last film that I did that are really helping things out. And, and I learned a lot by taking it to a high-quality studio. I, had, I was ready. I delivered all sorts of reference files of video to the, to the uh, post-studio, uh, stems of sections, individual stuff I had ready. Now, keep in mind, for the, uh, writing a feature, is I, I, kinda, I don't consider it a symphony. I consider it more like a cantata, where you have a series of short pieces of music that are anywhere from two to five minutes at the most. It can be 30 seconds to five minutes. That's your typical scene. There are extended scenes. But generally, imagine going to a studio when you've gotten all your parts done. You've gone through each scene. And this brings up all sorts of technological challenges in that should I chop up the movie, the video, into separate sessions or try and do the whole thing and score it. My preference is to chop it up into small scenes and then make each session work on that, send that to the director, have okay on that and move forward from there. Is uh, the natural start... inclination is the natural inclination from somebody who's new at scoring shorts or indie films um, to just do music under everything? How do you learn the art of when to not score? A scene or part well, of you scene. start with the spotting session from the director uh, and and they're gonna and you go through it with them so you don't wind up scoring a bunch of stuff they don't necessarily want now I have a habit of over scoring I figure my process is this at least in the, in the last number of films I'm gonna start let's say it's a short and at short I'm not necessarily gonna break it up into scenes I'm talking about a feature you have a feature that's 50 to 80 minutes or whatever that is, I'm going to break that up into two, two, three minute chunks. Cause that way the logic sessions aren't too crazy. Right. And you don't have to find your way through these things. And, and you can, anyway, that's how I work. But when you're talking about a short or something like that, it's maybe 12 minutes, 15 minutes. I'm just, that's the whole thing. That's a scene as far as I'm concerned on there. I'm going to um, overscore it end to end with, with music probably, and then let them work in and out of it. The, the, the Son, the Father film that I did for a very, very high quality director, actor, Lucas Hostel, uh, he's done an amazing job with shorts. Uh, and, and I was hired to do that. In the end, I overscored the heck out of that movie. Uh, and then it kept chopping it down, chopping it down. And eventually the film doesn't have a whole lot much less of my music, except for the ending credits, which is just wacky as hell and, and the vocals on it were the dialogue in reverse <laughs> i thought that was genius anyway um 
that film, again, started overscoring. And in general, I tend to do that. I figure it's easier to take things away than to add. Is it? Uh, and, that, and that would be my me. question. Does, does the producer or director fall in love with everything? And even though you might realize, oh, no, I've overscored this, um, do they fall in love with the fact that it's wall-to-wall music and then you would have a hard time winning that battle to take some stuff out and give it a little air? No. I, I mean, I, I think they're going to they're gonna do what they're going to do. I don't, you know, in the end, I've learned... Once I'm done with what I got to do, they're going to edit out whatever they don't like or what they're not comfortable with, or I'm going to have to redo something again. Now, I'm talking about end-to-end scoring with maybe solo piano. That's how I like to work. I'm not talking about right. full orchestral mock-ups uh, and then end-to-end. I'm just not going to do that. But what I will do is put thematic ideas in there and try and th- uh, do them from the beginning to the end of the film as much as I can leaving out a few spaces if I really don't think they're going to go there. And that way, I'm not too invested into that score. I can always change it. And that seems to work. I'm still probably going to work in smaller, even on a, on a uh, short, I'm probably going to work on two to three minute com- scenes. If you watch a movie, movies are made up of scenes. They really mm-hmm. are. So the, uh, the reality is you work on one scene at a time and then you move to the next. There's a natural break in most films where the scene changes. Right. So uh, it's, it's not that hard to create a spotting session. One great thing that's super important is you have to be very, very organized in your scoring and you have to keep track of all of these sessions and have codes on all of your uh, tracks. So it's, you know, scene one, whatever, and, and you have to keep track of time code. There's, there, again, there's a lot of interesting technological challenges. Uh, when you drop in video, uh, you have an audio track. Okay, so you put that in there. Usually I ask for a 10 count two pop. That's the 10, 9, 8, 7, 6 plus a blip. That, right. that kind of a thing that you see in old movies. Even though we don't really need that, you'll find if you don't give them that, some kind of a visual oral cue, it's very hard for the editors later to synchronize the footage uh, Absolutely. To, the, to the music score you're getting them. And often I've sent things where they were screwed up and they put them in a different place. Now, sometimes that was on purpose. I can spend a lot of time synchronizing film. Like as the earth turns, that film, understand that's a silent film. There's no dialogue. I right. had to score that end to end. What's really wild about silent film scoring, it's even more involved now, is that in the old days, silent films were done in a theater and you had live musicians playing, which means if there was a silence, you heard the rattle of the projector, you heard people <laughs> walking around. It wasn't like dead silence. There was always something going on. What, when you're working on digital, if there's a silence, there is nothing, zero, nada, man. So, you, you know, there's not even hiss on the score and so a dead silence sounds like there's something wrong with the movie so that can be really funny with the silent film from the beginning to the end therefore i scored that thing wall to wall there's maybe one or two breaks just as there was a a fade out that just and i had to watch that to keep that fade out very limited on there anyway Uh, that taught me total synchronization of music to everything and what i'm really proud of is there's points where the actor is pounding their hand on a table and I have a sound that's locked in with that. So it's really right. a cool oral score to that film. It's, you know, t- and, that, t- and there's themes that pop in and the whole bit. Again, it was a really t- fun film to do. Take a, take a breath for a second. I got to ask yeah. you this question. Um, I remember years ago, I saw Martin Scorsese's composer on many of his films. I can't remember the lady's name, um, but she was getting uh, an Oscar. And she said, I would like to give some advice to all you young composers out there, which is um, find film students, because that's how I met Marty. I met him in film school. He needed a score done, so I did one for him on spec. Uh, what do you think about the the concept of people not being afraid to do a film or two on spec and know that they're not going to get any money so that they get the experience before they actually get hired for money on something and look like they don't know that much yet? Uh, do you agree yeah. with that that theory? Well, that's a tricky one. There's there's a lot of posts these days on on social media about this. Should I work for free? And, and I would say it's split half and half. The people that are young 
that haven't done much, they're like, yeah, I'm going to work for free if I want the experience. certainly makes sense. Uh, and then there's people like, no, you really shouldn't. You should establish a professional thing on there. I think my, my feeling is if you want experience, you can make your own films, get some footage and score it and understand how to do that. I generally, when I, when I really want to work on a film and I know they don't have much of a budget, usually my beginning statement is, look, I can't work for free, but I can work within your budget. What do you got? And yeah, then usually I mean, they start to go, well, yeah, I got something. So, I, you know, I think that's part of the negotiation. Whether it's ethical to do that or not, I can't tell you. Certainly with, uh, with student films, that's expected. And, in fact, one of the first films I scored was through a company that was kind of connecting with student filmmakers at the time, uh, and I wound up doing a kind of a neat film noir score before I knew what the heck I was doing. And, uh, and it was for free, and that was fine. So, But that was a different time a million years ago. <laughs> but uh, So I, I don't know. I can't really answer that question. What I would say is you've got to use your judgment and, and don't devalue what you do. But you have to learn how to do this stuff for sure. And contacting film schools and offering your services to people uh, certainly makes a lot of sense because those students aren't necessarily have any money to do it. And they, they do want to have something, you know, it would be nice for them to have something scored. And, and yeah, one, one, of the is, great mar one of the great marketing things that I learned many, many years ago is, yeah, you could call the professor who's teaching film at, you know, Cal State Northridge or whatever. The best thing to do is actually go to the school, walk down the hall, and there will inevitably be bulletin boards in the hallways. Yeah. And, and and put up one sheets that say I you know I will score your film, uh, and right. it's amazing how many calls you get because the people looking for somebody to score they're going to call a friend of theirs in a band or somebody that's got a rig in their dorm room or something that person may or may not be good at scoring you know so when they see somebody that says I can score films call me here's my number and put those little tear off things like you would do for apartment for rent or something like that, you know, or bed for sale so that they can tear off your number and call you. I think that's such a great idea. No, absolutely. I, I would look into that. I, what's ironic for me right now as a producer is I'm trying to approach film schools to present my film because it's such a great history of film production from a 1930s movie that they can learn from. So I'm actually trying to connect with film schools to do presentations there. And of course, it doesn't. Or film filmmakers in general, places where they hang out. Uh, and and any time you've created films that have music, you know, try and get a hold of scenes uh, that you can demonstrate, uh, that you can put out there. And that's not always so easy because a lot of times those those films um, are in festivals and they can't really be posted anywhere. But you right. usually are going to get a good copy of that, and you can send that out. Uh, you have a link on Vimeo, a private link or something like that, and have people watch it that way. So and you, here, know, you, can, here's, you don't have to have stuff on your website. Here's a word to the wise. If you're taking somebody else's existing footage and you score it and you're really, really happy with what you've done, don't take that and put it up on YouTube because it's their footage. You are going to get yourself a reputation as somebody that doesn't respect the copyright on, on their um, footage. And you don't want that to happen. So it's one thing to take somebody else's footage and score to it for the experience. It's another thing to put it out there for the world to see. Yeah, there, there's a big interest in this. Um, they did a Westworld challenge by Spitfire. I remember. Ask, I think you're asking about music libraries a little bit, and I'll talk about that. But Spitfire uh, did a challenge, and they actually worked with HBO, and they got a scene from, from Westworld. They got like 10,000 entries, something crazy. It was nuts. And, and, uh, and, and the winner won a bunch of software and hardware or something like that. Uh, but people have been posting that scene all over Hell and Gone now and using that for demonstration. Uh, so, you know, you can certainly do that. Uh, right, but, but that, yeah, was the, really that was, that was the, you know, that was the, that was the, posting. that was the intent from the beginning. It, it was a decision that the, you know, that was made in advance of letting people use that footage. So, you know, in that case, it, it's kosher, but uh, yeah, right. just yeah. to find somebody yeah. else's stuff, you know, somewhere online in a stash, score to it and put it up online, not so kosher. Let's go back to um, the changes. Now, 
um, is it common that the producer is also the director on a short or an indie, or are there usually two people, a producer and a director, and which one of those people is your boss? Who hires you, and who is your creative thumbs up or thumbs down person? Yeah, boy, that's a tough question. I would say smallest productions, little guys, are the director and the producer are one of the same. Uh, but there's more and more cases where people are banding together and creating my, many production companies, and you may have a combination. I would say the director generally is the person I have to please. The producer is there to take the film and do all of the aspects together, not really monitor the artistic effort as much as the business effort of the film. That's, true. That's what I've learned as being a producer myself. In fact, there are an executive producer, but somebody who actually is involved investment-wise, they almost cannot uh, be involved in artistic stuff because that could be a conflict of interest with the success. If the fail, if the anyway, their contra- the way it's contracted, it could be a problem. So you're really careful about that. So I would say the director is usually the person that makes that decision on, on yes or no on whether the music's there. Now the director at some point has to please the producer because the producer may have hired the director. The producer can fire the director and bring somebody else in. <laughs> so you have a whole loop of events that can happen. I think most of us that are working on independent films, the director is going to be the person we're mostly working with. And if we do a deal with the producer, it will be for technical reasons to get footage, to get connected with the editor, the film editor, the music editor, whatever that is. And, so and does the... Sure that the yeah. Does the, does the producer sign the contract, but the director is your creative boss? Does your contract specify um, that the director is the creative boss, or do you have to worry about the producer's, you know, wife or family member or best friend saying, you know, some dailies right. or, or or some segment that you've scored, going, well, I don't like that. And now the producer is giving you creative right. direction. How do you deal with the politics of that? I I don't think. In a, in a small indie film, that's the issue. Now, the, 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 the film that I scored where my, my music got cut quite a bit, the director was the person that made the decision and the producer and the, the crew and all that. They just kind of said, okay, we'll do that. So I, I would say the director has to be pleased with it. I rarely put any kind of uh, information about director producer on the contract. The contract is usually between my my uh, record company production company and their production company. That's really how it works. Now I have an LLC. I mean, the other thing interesting about as the Earth turns is I became owner of the LLC. I own the film estate of this director wow. now. I have 60 millimeter film 20 feet away from me that I'm dealing with as well. So a producer's job has a much larger spectrum. I don't think they really want to be that involved in the day-to-day decisions, including what kind of music's on there. They may be involved in the decision of budget and making decisions. What I think where the play between the director and the, and the filmmaker, uh, the, 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 the producer is, is when the director says, I, I want to have this music in there, and the producer says, we can't afford that. And that, that's the battleground there. Uh, so, you know, I'm not involved in that battle generally. They're, they're going to come to me later and say, this is what we can afford. So, Do you ever... I, I'm, I, again, I think pleasing the director is, your, is going to be your 99% thing until you're working for Warner Brothers, in, in which case all bets are off. <laughs> okay, so now we, we live in a world where two things happen. Um, people working on films with pretty good budgets to excellent budgets can hire a remote orchestra like the, the Prague, right. Prague Orchestra um, or, or you know score it on a, on a scoring stage. Um, but I would guess that the vast majority of indie films and certainly shorts are done in the box. Um, do you that's ever right. have a director that says, wow, this doesn't sound good enough? It doesn't sound like real strings? Or are they happy with the sound that they, they get, uh, sound that you get or other composers get out of the box? Is that well, bar well, high enough for them? Filmmakers in general rarely talk in musicians' terms. And that's one big lesson that we all learn. Uh, I may 
tell a filmmaker, oh, I'm using this orchestra or whatever. They don't care. They don't know what I'm telling I'm talking about. They're <laughs> listening to it from a gut level in the end. And if right. emotionally that music satisfies the scene, they're going to be happy no matter what it's played on. So I, I, I think, you know, that tends to solve itself. Uh, if, if somebody says we really want a bigger sound, we want bigger drums, bigger whatever, and I use live percussion whenever I can, so that's my live element. Right. I do use east-west orchestras. I like those. A lot of composers have issues with them. But they, I, for me, I, my secrets are this. I use east-west, and I use their pianos, their violin, and their cello solos. And one of the secrets is to put those live or I should say, put those solo instruments on top. So I think there's many ways you can solve the quality issue. In the end, the word mock-up originally meant create something that, you know, kind of sounds like an orchestra, then we'll hire an orchestra to play it, and we're mocking right. it up. Nowadays, a mock-up is a final product, and that's just the way it is. And and I think if they're, if you keep your expectations down and you talk to a filmmaker ahead of time and say, look, if you want to increase your budget by 100000 we can hire an orchestra for sure. But here's my thoughts. I can put together a pretty decent electronic score with some live parts. Maybe we should bring in a couple of live violins and a flute or something like that, and I think you're going to like the end result. Most of the time they're going to say, hey, that's pretty good. That worked out. What my challenge to anybody that's watching this, that wants to watch as the earth turns, is I would like them to watch it and then tell me what's live and what's not live, what's not Memorex, and then I'll and email me and I'll I'll tell you what happened. I don't want to give it away. I don't want to tell you that. I want you to know what what is there because I think you can fake a lot electronically these days. It's all in the you know. There's there's something organic you need to put in a score to make it sell. This is true about licensed music as oh, well. Oh, absolutely. We recommend that to members all the time. All it takes yeah. is literally something as simple as a tambourine, or like you said earlier, a triangle, um, right. you know, congas, bongos, an acoustic guitar strum. Even if the strum is just like an open chord G on a downbeat, oh. there's something about that, that that brings humanity to the track and takes it That's out of right. the box. You um, know, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you this thanks as well. There was a, a track I submitted to Taxi a number of years ago, and I was using the Logic piano. And it was okay, but, and I talked to a friend of mine, uh, Doug Zanger, who's the Logic guru of all time. He does Groove 3 tutorials. Here's your phone a friend. Let me know if you have problems with Logic. He's your guy to go. Anyway, what's his, what's his name again? One of the problems with the Logic piano was the, the uh, volume skips, the velocity tends to jump. It's not sampled that deep. And when I moved to east-west pianos, all of a sudden I had close, medium, and far miking. I had all sorts of other things. And all of a sudden my piano tracks got a whole, whole lot better. So little choices you make on solo instruments can make a big difference. I think strings in general can sound pretty lush these days. Many orchestras can do it. But, man, live instruments are so tough, and it takes... Like on bass tracks, when I'm doing an upright bass track, I'm putting glissandos in there at the end of doo, at the end of things, just little tiny subliminal mm -hmm. things that most people would never hear that help sell the track. And people go, "Wow, who'd you play bass on that?" And I go, "Well, I don't know, this is a guy I met, you know." <laughs> but uh, that, those are the tricks you can do on that. So I, you know, I, I recommend be as as you know. As, this gets harder when you start talking about music for film that goes on for you know an hour at a time to do all of that right. small detail work can take a lot of time and at some point you may go man this is going to take me more time than just hiring somebody to do it and i have thousands of people i could call even in the taxi group remotely to do it a track for any of this stuff as well so I a lot of people have a budget to hire them for a reasonable amount of money to, to do that a lot of you people know, and then who... you gotta get their work for hire clearance and all of the rest of that a lot of people who are just starting out might get, you know, like East West or something, and they're just sitting there making pretty chords and kind of riffing with their new software. And, and a well-meaning friend or family member might say, wow, you should be scoring films. But there's a technical side to it that, yeah, you might be able to make some pretty sounding pads with your new software. But can you explain the technical aspects of like, 
um, when you're working to, well, for lack of a better example, John Travolta walking down the street in Saturday Night Fever, and you're making music that times out to his footsteps on the, on the sidewalk. So obviously you've got to deal with the timing of stuff, which relates to the time signature and where beats right. fall. And now all of a sudden they've changed the scene. Maybe they've changed the, the physical tempo of the scene, or maybe they've just edited in and out of something. How do you learn those skills? Well, again, I would, I would just practice score against anything you can. Th music tends to be scene-oriented, so usually you score a scene in one particular tempo and then it moves to another, and then through the mix, they get mixed together so you can have overlap. And keeping in mind, when you, let's say you divide the scores, uh, you divide the scenes on different sessions, be aware of the key you're in going out of a session into the next one. If it's the same key, then it can blend right in. Right. And, and you have an, and you would never notice as, a, as an audience member that those are separate tracks, but they really were. As far as nowadays with logic, you can change the tempo up and down as you go, and the video will adjust, which is mind-blowing when you think about that. So if you want to hmm. slow the music down, you can against the track and, and make it work. What you're usually going to do is spend an awful lot of time in pre-production of your track going through and spotting your own sessions and putting hit points where you're trying to lead up to an event, make sure you right. have moments up there in the uh, in the notes, kind of at the top there on the regions that you're working on, all of that. And then you kind of work from there. You outline basically each thing and go from there and find a, a general uh, pacing for what that's going on. And if there is something that's moving at a certain rate, you identify that beats per minute on there and set that up. Uh, you know, from that. So, uh, you know, when you start getting into something like Santa Island Fever, where you have dance tracks and things like that, those are going to be more licensed kind of tracks right. where they're going to come in, they're going to adjust the video to the to the music, vice than vice versa. Who knows? They're you know they're going to actually shoot that with the music playing so that they can march to that. that are there? On there. Are there um, books that you would recommend? By the way, your links didn't show up earlier, so before we sign off today, I want to have you give all the links you're talking about and make sure that they show up in the chat so people can find sure. the stuff, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. We've only got okay. uh, 23 minutes left. Um, so are, are there any books that you would recommend on, you know, like Scoring 101? Are there particular videos on YouTube? by people that you think are incredibly good instructors, where people who know how to make those pretty sounding pads, but don't know anything about the technical side of scoring, where do they learn that? Um, well, uh, I, I got a plain ignorance on this one. I, I generally taught most of this stuff myself, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you know, I, on my resources page, I put as many links as I can, as a massive page on all of these, subjects so there's there's many many places on there you can look um i you know ironically as a, as a musician i've been involved in music since i was 10 and uh I, and I did get involved in filmmaking and if i hadn't gone into music i think i would have wound up at cal arts in the 70s probably hanging around with steven spielberg which is a wild mind-boggling second life that i could done so now i'm back to this on that side but as far as scoring there are places you can go to film score. In fact, in Seattle, there's the Pacific Northwest Scoring Institute by Hummy Mann, who I've gotten over the years. And he's a remarkable composer, conductor, arranger. Uh, and, and there are places, if you really want to do it, you can go there and they'll put you on computers and work out all of the detail on this sort of thing. And film schools have programs more and more like this as well. I think there's so much stuff on YouTube right now uh, on you know most of it's learning the tech one classic uh, you know comment that will be repeated by almost every composer that's tried this will say there are no rules that in film scoring right. there's no rules it's like jazz you do what <laughs> makes sense for the scene and and that's it and whatever it takes, you do that. And it can be a weird, wacky electronic score. It can be an orchestral thing. It can be anything you want in there. And the they, director's got to agree with it. And it may fail. And, and I can tell you this, that if you fail and your score gets rejected, 
like mine did, you're in good company because <laughs> Alex North was hired by Stanley Kubrick to do 2001 film score. Kubrick probably never wanted that. He, uh, he had his idea on using classical music, but he had, had to hire, but MGM forced him to hire a composer, so he had poor Alex North. Alex North shows up to the premiere in London, and his music is not in the movie. Ooh, he was not he had, told this ahead of oh, time. Oh, man. This is one of the Ouch. Ter most terrible experiences of all time by a composer. It took him years to recover. You know, that was a, a terrible thing that happened. But that happens out there. So you can be the top composer in the world and still get your stuff rejected. Therefore, you just keep going after it, and you figure, hey, some are going to work, some aren't. Just like licensing, uh, again, the key is get paid. And Alex North was paid. So that that's the, that's the key for that as well. And wow. you can actually hear that Alex North score uh, they on DVDs if you want to hear what what he originally did. Oh, really? You mean on official DVD releases of, of um, 2001 that they actually have an alternate score version? You yes, can watch? I believe they do. I've heard about that. Uh, now there is a wonderful organization. To me, organizations are more important than specific book resources. There's the Academy of Film Scoring, which is really just a nonprofit organization in L.A. And when every time I was down in L.A. last year, I went to one of the Saturday morning sessions with major composers taking apart their scores for people. And that was a really cool thing. I met Bear McCreary there, who was originally from the Northwest, uh, who, you know, and his path was he got to know Elmer Bernstein working on his boat in Bellingham, Washington. Mm. <laughs> how he got into film scoring 10 years ago. Wow. So there, there's many directions in this. The, the people that are in L.A. that are doing this are on a whole other level generally. They're very tremendous scoring people. They can develop their own scores. They're usually working with orchestras, and they're working in the industry pretty heavily. So um, I'm doing this from Seattle from a distance. Yeah. Now, I got involved in the Seattle Composers Alliance a long time ago, and one key thing for me is that like in many things, I realized to be on the inside of the ropes meant I, I couldn't, if I'm going to be in an organization, I can't just be a fly on the wall as a member. I got on the board of directors and wound up getting involved in presenting things. And in fact, what I can tell you is that when I was on the board, I developed a, a program where we actually had a uh, what do you call it, a speed dating. I created up a speed dating event for filmmakers and composers. And we had a dozen composers and a dozen filmmakers, some of which are pretty well-known filmmakers these days. And they would go five minutes with each, and you could play some stuff for them. It was incredible, yet to be repeated. But that was because I was involved in that particular organization on the board. I also got to know the person, the educational director of the Seattle International Film Festival, and you can draw a line from that event all the way to our premiere in 2019 at the Seattle International Film Festival, where he actually probably engineered getting my film in that festival and having it presented in a 1915 theater. So there, there's many... <laughs> serendipity does rule out there and I would advise everybody to pay attention to things that are going on in their life at all times and don't discount the neighbor or the person across the street or the person you met in a bar that they aren't going to be involved in your life in some way and that's something I've learned a hundred times over and that's why I try and put my keep myself open to events and situations all the time and anytime you can teach you, you can turn the tables and, and like right now, I find it incredible that I'm telling you how to score films because I have tremendous, uh, you know, imposter syndrome about this as everybody does. So <laughs> tell them, uh, tell them know, what the, tell them what the imposter syndrome is just imposter in case. Imposter syndrome is, is a syndrome that everybody has. It just means simply that we're all faking this situation while we're alive. Uh, and, and there's times Beethoven had imposter syndrome, I am absolutely sure, as incredible as that might sound. There are times when we second guess and we go, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, and, and that's very, very true, especially if you add the technological issues you have to learn doing all this stuff uh, and, and, and figuring I have the audacity to try and sound like an orchestra. What the hell am I doing? And then I had the audacity to enter a film from 1938 in the Oscars last year. Are you kidding me? 
I mean, everything about this is crazy. I was mocking up advertising in Variety and uh, Hollywood Reporter last year. You know, and I'm and I'm meeting with guys at Turner Classic Movies for lunch. I mean, this, this is nuts. Wow. You know, so but you if you open yourself up to that, it's amazing what you can do. If you kind of think small, that's the life you're going to get. But if you think insanely big, like everybody does in Hollywood, man, you know, funny things happen very quickly. You said a very key word five minutes ago at the beginning of this particular subject, which is don't be a lurker, I think you said. Uh, yeah. You know, we see that all the time from inevitably taxi members that ask for a refund ha at best have been a lurker. Uh, probably they've never watched a taxi TV. Maybe they've looked at the forum a couple of times. They've never come to the road rally. They're not getting involved and they're not getting all, all the advantages that being a member uh, of the taxi tribe bring to you. And, and so you're a great um, example of how that all works out. You and I should talk not for the 2020 rally, but assuming that 2021 we're able to do a physical rally, I would love to set up speed dating for composers and filmmakers at, at that that's rally. That's a great idea. I'd love to help with that. that that's a huge concept. And, and that brings in indie filmmakers into the rally for the first time, which they right. really need to be at places like that. I think that's a wonderful idea. That was my motivation. Uh, it's not hard to do. It's really pretty simple on there. So I'm, I'm open to that idea big time. I I've wanted been on to film do... scoring panels too. And, uh, you know, there's a Seattle Film Summit that's now going to be virtual this year. And for the third year, I'll be on a film scoring panel. Those are places. In fact, I created those panels the first couple of years and I brought in music supervisors to the panels. Right. And I guess who got to talk to the supervisors? Me. Yep. <laughs> so. I, last year, I tried to pull something off that ended up not happening, which was getting a bunch. I reached out to like film independent and a, other, a bunch of other organizations and said, look, your filmmakers don't understand what royalty free means. I I would love to have take that 200 seat private theater that we've got at the Westin every year and, and do an evening event like six to seven thirty where we've got a publisher, a music attorney and a couple library owners, maybe. And let's talk about how you don't need to limit yourself to just royalty free libraries. That's right. You can license yeah. stuff from people at the road rally. And, and you know what they told me at Film Independent, which was, uh, well, buy some advertising with us and we'll think about it, basically. Yeah. I, I got to say this. That, that, this is what I appreciate about Taxi. I got to tell you this story. That I, you know, I've come and done a couple of events, a couple of teaching sessions and been a mentor at the rally. And I tell people what amazes me about Taxi is none of us get paid. And we right. come and do that. We not only come to this thing, but spend our time doing that rather than going to some of the events. I mean, that's kind of crazy if you think about it, but that's how cool the hang is. And it'll be interesting to see what happens virtually, how that works. Uh, but ASCAP has, has had a similar event and, and they did a nice job online. But when I asked them, you know, I, hey, I teach a licensing class and I do that for anybody that's watching. I do teach licensing uh, individually in classes. And, uh, and I said, I'm interested in teaching a class there. I was just hoping to get out of the $350 fee to get right. in. And they said, well, to do a class here, you got to do a corporate membership. Those start at $5,000. And wow. then we'll think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the way I was treated at Film Independent. And I said, hey, I'm bringing yeah. something to your member body that you guys are not teaching them, and I'm going to do it for free in a great setting for them. And, and that's basically yeah. what they told me. 5,000 was the number, you know? Right, right. Well, um, I and have I have other organizations for you to connect with. Awesome. So don't worry I, about I, them. I would love to meet those. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is, I really, really, really want to push the whole indie film thing at Taxi because, yeah. I mean, Every single time we run listings for indie filmmakers, the vast majority, if not 100% of the music in the films comes from taxi members. I love that. Whether it's background source music in a bar, um, little scored cues, whatever, it, right. it, it comes from people and they're thrilled to be in those. Um, let's take a couple of questions. We've only got about 11 minutes left and I wanna save the last five minutes to put those links up. 
Um, okay. Let's take a couple of questions from the people and the, the viewers in the audience. So if you guys have a question, type the word question in all caps, follow it with your question. Let's try and get a couple of those banged out in the five minutes we have left. I'm hitting some uh, links while we're talking here. I'm not sure that they're posting. Last time you said you were, I mean, are you seeing the chat that we're on? Yeah. Because last time you posted, they didn't show up. That's weird. Am I, am I not showing my chat? I, I just put a couple. Are they there? Nope, they're not there. Oh, okay. Well, no, um, maybe it'll take a second because there's a delay. Because <laughs> we're talking ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, we didn't. Um, the stuff you did earlier, I was waiting for it to show up. It never did. Oh, well, that's weird. I don't know what it is. Am and I, you're actually... something I'm missing on... Uh, no, I mean, uh, if you're seeing the chat about what we're talking I'm about... I'm seeing the then, chat and I'm seeing my name with stuff in there. So nope, uh, only the channel administrator can post. Users can't. Well, oh, can't it's because you can't post links. That's right. I'll tell you what email them to um, taxi TV at taxi.com email all the links and Liz will post them that's the problem all right taxi so TV at, at taxi.com okay um, Ken Mesford I'm not gonna ask uh, Ed who he knows it's, you know it doesn't help anybody else out if he goes yeah I know him and you go oh, great I know him too I'm sorry I don't mean to be rude but it just doesn't help educate the masses here. Um, here's a question from Gabby Moore. Do you have any advice when you have a blank page? I have that problem every day. Uh, boy. Um, well, if, if you're talking about scoring, uh, that happens with every composer every day. That when they start a project, that's always the first thing that happens is they stare at it and they go, and this is the imposter syndrome. I've, I've seen this a hundred right. times written on, on Facebook as I, I look at it and I realize I have no idea how to score this film. I have no clue. You got to try five or six things and do it. Uh, there's many, many ways people talk about solving that. Sometimes it's taking a walk. <laughs> Sometimes it's watching the movie a few more hundred times. Uh, you know, I think if you have a good spotting session with somebody, you know, with the director, you're probably going to get around that because you're, you're already have hopefully developed five or six themes if you're going that direction. And then you can play that for them in the spotting section and say, well, this is kind of my love theme. This is my whatever. And, uh, and they go, yeah, I like that or I don't like that. And that gets you started. Uh, so, you know, you can create at least an outline or something from there. Now, with electronic scores that are not thematic, you have a lot of that, like this film I did, this Son of the Father film, that was really a, an electronic atmospheric score. And right. it was almost sound design, and that's where I got into trouble because I was probably stepping on the sound design part as well, the ambience. Uh, so those become a whole other world on there, and you know, and and you have so many sounds to choose from in a in a program like Logic, ambient sounds and synths and stuff. The biggest problem for me is more how do I decide what to use? You know, there's too many damn sounds to work on from that. So. You know, I don't know. That That's a tough one. Uh, we're a, a little bit of a at the mercy of too much stuff, you know. So I, I think what you have to focus on is think like the director. The director is not thinking, oh, I want a synth sound here. What they're thinking is, I want a sound that sounds like pink, or I need something that's got a mellow kind of a, you know, get me whatever, you know, or a little... They're not even going to use the word suspense. They're going to they're going to say, you know, I need something that that's going to like hit me in the ass at the at this point here with the with the knife. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're, they're they're going to speak in filmmakers' term, which is either yeah. sto story or emotion. Yeah. Um, so you watch the movie as an audience member and forget about forget about uh, musical terms and talk in audience terms and emotional here, terms and stuff like that. Here's a couple other questions. Um, what type of tracks do you write other than scores? Well, a lot of my success has been uh, in uh, source music, music heard on a radio or something like that. Football Funk was a marching band track. And by the way, that was done on a Tascam 8-track pre-DAW, pre-digital wow. audio. And, uh, and
and it, it had two roll, I had a rolling keyboard, high, low brass and live percussion on my crazy drum set, which can sound like a drum, uh, drum line. Uh, and that's, and I, I've had a lot of success with earlier tracks that were not recorded that way. Now the track that was on the twilight zone is your classic pizzicato 1950s, uh, type of tune, uh, that you would hear, you know, on a, in a, on a commercial. And it was used as a fake commercial in the twilight zone, uh, episode they're doing. And thanks to taxi, that was through the immortal crucial music that that track got placed along with any number of other tracks that I've been very successful with. Uh, they're such a great company to work with. Uh, here's Although another question. Here, really here's, tough to work with. I mean, here's they're, they're an- very picky. Another question. We've only got five minutes left. Sure. Um, uh, Mr. Hartman, how old were you when you made your first placement or you made your first deal? Well, uh, I'm uh, 75 years old, and um, anyway, <laughs> I was in my late 30s to 40s, okay, and that was in 2000. <laughs> okay. Um, so that gives you a sense of it anyway without giving it away, and you know, this is a young person's world, so we don't ever want to tell how old we are anymore. Um, um, but, here's... you know, so it, yeah, it was fairly recent for me, but, you know, I've been writing music. Uh, when I first moved to Seattle, I created a composer series. Again, I didn't just sit in the back, and I had major composers along with street musicians on the same show. I mean, I've done all sorts of crazy things moving to Seattle. Uh, and after college, I was a percussion major, uh, and I, but I always wrote music. Even in college, I wrote music, and uh, even though when I was just performance and I got chastised for trying to be a composer, so... I've been fighting that one all my life. <laughs> here's here's another question. Um, did you use Logic to learn how to sync the music, or did somebody else do that? Yeah. No, Logic is all about syncing. That, that's the whole point of it. And, and when I was in Super 8 film as a kid, I was trying to put records against film, and I was always, my dream was to sync music to film, and I couldn't do it because it was silent. Ironically, Richard Lyford on this 1938 film, he was syncing dual turntables to a 60 millimeter projector, which had never been done at the time uh, in the early uh, sound era. So I'm following up with him. Logic has given us this incredible ability to synchronize our music to visuals like this. And it's built in. Now, when I started, Logic's video tools were a little more, they weren't quite as good. Now they're right on. Everything's very, very seamless. But you just got to make sure you, you talk to your film editors, your music editors, and make sure that they understand what you're doing. Because you can do a wonderful job of sync, but if they don't know where to start the track, it's all trashed. So there's um, nothing worse than that. <laughs> did, you, did you email those links to Taxi TV? I'm, I'm working on it right here as I'm chatting. I'm trying to see if there's a few more here. All right. Most of we... them are on my web. I'll just send you what I got here. Most all of right. them are on my website. Uh, if you go to hartmanmusic.com in general, and everything's off of there. Put your you find put, everything in there. Put your website link on there as well. I, I did, yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. So yeah, send that right now because we've only got two minutes left. Okay. Um, go ahead. So send that right now so that Liz can get it up in the chat and people can see it. I just did. Um, okay. Now, if I if I type in without, let me try something. I'm going to try that. <laughs> that show? Hasn't shown up yet, is. but there is a little bit of a delay. Okay. Well, anyway. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, oh, you got it. It looks like you got it. Yeah, Liz is posting them up. Now. And as your turns will go to, uh, oh, I just got, they got part of one of them. They're kind of jammed together. But as your turns will take you to edhartmanmusic.com. So that works too. Gotcha. Anyway. Yeah, and, my, and uh, again, you can email me off the website and all the rest of it. I'm on Facebook. Feel free to friend me on that um, and connected with a lot, of, a lot of things. I just created another kind of a page called Get Your Music on Film and TV. I do uh, teach a class through North Yale College. I'm 10 years at least on that. And then I teach individually. I've been doing a lot of Zoom sessions. I'll tell you, Zoom is better for teaching licensing than some person. I can share I wish we had done it today. I could share documents and music and the whole bit. So I'm having a wonderful time doing it. I can do an hour or two with somebody and take care of everything they need to do to do it. What I'm seeing missing in a lot of programs 
is people don't talk about setting up your own publishing and things like that. And that's what I'm good at. I've been talking about this for years, is to start somebody and make sure all their toolkits in place, business side, uh, and then and their technical side have their, the equipment to record all the rest of it, and and get them get them ready for that, and then start pitching and all the rest of it. But you you got to be ready with your pro and BMI and ASCAP and all that stuff has to be set up, or you're going to run into trouble later. Yep. Uh, so yeah. uh, we are out of time, Ed. Thank you, man. I, I don't know anybody who could dispense that much information in ninety <laughs> minutes as as you just have. Good thing you're a fast talker, but a clear talker, and really, Good. really not not a wasted word. So I appreciate that. Um, always great hanging out with you. Um, and uh, let's keep that heavily in mind. Speed dating for composers and filmmakers yeah. at the the twenty twenty one road rally and. Uh, I will talk to you soon. Congratulations, man. Uh, Thank you're you. a, a very nice guy, an extremely hardworking guy, and nothing gets me more excited than people who work hard and find success. So congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ed Hartman. Yeah, baby. Hey, hey. All right. We will talk soon, Thank my you, friend. Michael. I appreciate all the work you've done, too. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, I will talk to you soon. And everybody, hope you enjoyed the show as much as I did. Um, take care, and we will see you. Oh, I am going to do the Quarantini Happy Hour this week on um, Wednesday and Friday of this week. Okay, so we're doing today's show Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I've got road rally stuff that I'm doing on Tuesday and Thursday. So write that down. Taxi Quarantini Happy Hour on Wednesday and Friday at 4 o'clock right here on this very same channel. Take care, everybody. Whoops. There we go. See you soon.